So um, it will start. It means it allows me to um, to welcome everyone who's joining us uh, today for the uh, for the webinar series. Um, we're very happy to to have everyone here. I see that the number is 179 um, and still increasing. So that that's very good. Um, so the first webinar of our series is an introduction to sustainability transitions with uh, the the chairman of the Sustainability Transitions Research Network, uh, Jochen. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, okay. We to to go briefly. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction about the webinar series in in, in general, uh, what our plan is, and then um, Leo will take over from me, um, moderating this part, uh, particular session with Jochen. Um, and afterwards the Q and A, and we'll, we'll keep you posted on on further further plans. Um, but first of all, to talk a bit about the, the webinar series and the plan, what we have um, is, and with we, I'm talking about uh, these three guys: uh, Leo, Julius, uh, and myself, Abe. Um, we had the idea that we wanted to to do a webinar series, basically to to, to get more early career researchers in uh, transition studies. Uh, connected and engaged in in, in the uh, in a dialogue and in a conversation um and we started it at just just three faces with the names you might see around and don't hesitate to reach out to us in any uh, possible means twitter julius is very good at um but we're all on twitter email uh, don't reach out, don't hesitate to reach out um and basically we we met each other we know each other from from nest or um we organized this webinar series also on behalf of, of nest as far as you can they can do something on behalf of a network uh, because network stands for the uh, nest stands for the network of early career researchers and sustainability transitions um i think most people here will know the conference this year we had the fifth couple of weeks ago and um hopefully next year we will have a physical conference again the sixth but um, it's a network, and it's more than just a, just a conference. It's basically we try to to connect with all kind of um, early career researchers interested in in the field of sustainability transitions. Um, it's good to mention that it's it's a network. It's related to the sustainability transitions research network, but as um as Nest ourselves, we don't really we aren't a fixed group. We aren't really tied mm -hmm. to to SDRN uh, too too close in the sense that you have to to be a member. At Nest is very much an open structure, and people are very much welcome uh, to join the conversation, to join organizing things such as a webinar series or a conference. But everything um, can become in dialogue, and don't also in that case don't uh, don't hesitate to to reach out to Nest uh, via the either the Twitter, the website, or um, or the email. Um, the short word on, on like why we want the webinar series is, is because basically we 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 notice ourselves that when we talk about sustainability transitions, we we start soon talking about abbreviations and um, a couple of big institutes in Europe mainly uh, have a big share in the transition studies, but it doesn't mean that other insights are not welcome. Quite contrary, so we wanted to to see if we can lower the barrier for uh, for early career researchers. Um, on one hand, and on the other hand, also engage with the interaction with senior researchers, so as Jochen will join us and, and later other senior researchers in the field to, to create a dialogue between, um, but on one hand, the, the, the early careers and on the other hand, the seniors um, on a, on a, in a quite informal, formal way. Um, and just a brief mention here, um, but we will we'll update you uh, via different means. But we are planning to, we are now having the, the session with Jochen, and then we have, are planning at least these three are set already, uh, the dates, with uh, Marco Hackett on uh, technological innovation systems, uh, Professor Gils uh, on the multi-level perspective, and uh, with Caroline Roga on policy mixes. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted on, on via our channel, so when more and more, um, and we're also trying to, to, to engage with other initiatives, so if you have yourself, um, you record your lectures or anything or don't hesitate to reach out because we're very happy to to create a platform online um, where people can find this uh, these kind of sources and this information to get yeah, to engage with the field. Um, that's it from my side. Do you think I forgot something, uh, guys? Um, maybe the, <laughs> the, this webinar will also be available on our um, YouTube channel um maybe not next week but eventually 
and we try to put all of these videos that we'll collect in the next year um, on this video channel so that it's just available for everyone so it's a clean inclusive way um, to yeah. yeah make knowledge available throughout the the network not just the nest but also the strn okay yeah. Abe, then i take the moderator status from you and give it now to jochen and then leo you will start talking isn't it absolutely Perfect. Well, in that case, uh, thanks, David, for the introduction. My name is Leo, and I now have the great pleasure to first introduce Jochen Marka, our first speaker. Um, Jochen is uh, a senior researcher and lecturer at the Group for Sustainability and Technology within the Department of Management, Technology and Economics at ETH Zurich. And his work focuses on the interaction of technology and active strategies, but also politics, policies, and institutional structures. And one of his central research interests is the emergence of a new technological system and the decline of existing ones. He's published basically in all relevant journals within sustainability transition studies and also beyond. That includes uh, Nature Energy, PNAS, Research Policy, of course, ICE, ERSS, you name it. And Jochen is also chairman of the SERN board, as we've already heard. At last year's NEST, um, he was introduced somewhat heretically as the high priest of sustainability transitions. So um, I could think of no one better to open this webinar series on core concepts in our research field. And we're very much excited to have you here, Jochen. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. To the, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining and thank you for organizing this. Um, when the three of you contacted me last last fall, I immediately liked the idea, and um, of course, then it took a while until we you got moving. But then, I mean, I think now it's even more important to have such a thing. And as you already pointed out, we are we are not a, like a, an established or a classical research fields with I mean, where you can have classes or you you have textbooks or other other material. And and for that reason, of course, I mean, we have to. I mean, we have to get there at some point, but we also have to develop tools that support us in this. And, and for, with that background, I think the webinar series is a is a very good idea to get better access and to provide better access for newcomers. And of course, I mean, right now in these times, um, these exploring new ways of how to exchange and discuss um, is is more important than ever. And before I start, maybe um, a, a few words. And so I, I present what I, what I will present now is, is the perspective of one researcher in the field. I happen to be the chair, but what I will present is are my personal insights and my experiences. I hope it will be helpful and to some extent interesting, but obviously it's not, it will not be exhaustive. So I look at certain things, for example, some of the um, some of the slides I will show they focus on climate and of course there are many other topics and like as we have seen from the nest conference a few weeks back there are many different perspectives and very interesting ones and I'm yeah I will not be able to to go into all of these also I have um, prepared the slides for you beforehand um, I have provided a lot of references in the slides um, so it's also meant to be like a tool you can use later on and see whether whether it helps you to navigate the field. Okay, with that we can start. So essentially the, the, the talk is split into two parts, if you will. So the first two parts are the introduction um, to the field and then in the third and fourth I address a few topics around the acceleration of transitions. And of course, I also spend a couple of slides on what is the current crisis and, and how do we deal with this, especially with regard to the other crisis out there, which is climate change. So to, to kick off, um, the first part about grand sustainability challenges, I mean, the main message here is that we live in difficult times. So we are confronted with numerous environmental but also societal problems and there are different concepts and approaches out there such as the planetary boundaries that point to the urgency um, also the um, 
uh, sustainable development goals that also, also show the variety of challenges we are faced with and the global nature of them. So how do we do that or how do we approach these challenges? What do we do? Um, a while back there was a debate um, about I mean, it, it is essentially said, well, climate change, I mean, we have tackled big challenges before. We have put on a man on the moon, so then, I mean, then we should also be able to tackle climate change. And this is, so here is a, here is a nice, this is a nice article by Mori and, and others in research policy who have looked into this debate. And of course, I mean, this it brings up a lot of questions and, what I've just briefly prepared here is like, are they really the same, like flying to the moon or and, and climate change? And we don't go through the table, don't be afraid. Um, you can check it later in detail. Um, the, the main message here is that there are a couple of issues, for example, the multidimensionality or the values that come in when we talk about climate change, they are very different from a technical problem, such as flying to the moon or flying to, to Mars, if we talk about challenges in, in current times. Um, also, there is no, no clear-cut solution. So there are many solutions available. These solutions are contested and it's, it's not easy to tell. And, and there also, again, there are uh, values, there are preferences. So different groups of actors, different people prefer different solutions. So there is a lot of struggle around these solutions. And we can go on. It's a global challenge. It's different from one nation driving a thing, but it's it's about coordination. It will take decades. It's it's a long time endeavor. The sad conflicting interests, broad range of policy goals and so on. So the main message here is we have some challenges. We can term them grand sustainability challenges and they are pretty complex and pretty difficult to solve. And also I put a couple of references in here, for example, Ferraro, they approach, I mean, it's, it's always about climate change and they approach it from a management perspective, Levine and Al, they um, approach it from a political science perspective. And the last reference in here is approaching things from a natural science perspective. So you can also see we're in a field where different disciplinary perspectives come together. So what does this have to do with sustainability transitions? So in my view, there is an important bridge from the problems we are facing to the frameworks we are suggesting here. So as the problems are pretty complex and also new and, and difficult and wicked or difficult to solve, and we cannot necessarily expect established frameworks, theories, policy concepts to be ready to deal with them. So there might be a need that for new tools and new perspectives on how to address these frameworks. And sustainability transition, at least in my view, can be such a perspective. It can help to address and to frame some of these challenges. Is it the only perspective for these complex challenges? Certainly not. Is it the best one? Is it, I mean, this is something we don't know that, know yet, and it, it's good to have many, but in my view, so since I've been dealing with sustainability transitions, it has, it's, it, it's not the only perspective, but for me, it has helped to give answers where I, reading, through other literatures, reading through other disciplines, there were always open questions and some of them, at least I found like, okay, yeah, but this dimension is missing. For example, the politics is missing in, 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 in many of the natural science or management perspectives or uh, the firm perspective that is, or the technology perspective that is missing in the political science perspective. Not always, but in, in many of the writings. So for, for me, the benefit of transition studies is that it tries to bring many of these perspectives together. But so let's go into it. Second part, a few basics. So when talking about sustainability transitions, we definitely ask, have to ask ourselves, so a transition, what is it? And what this slide here um, points out that 
for transitions at the core of transitions is a technology. It, so it's a technology that de develops over time. And we're also looking at time spans, not of years, but rather of decades. But then again, it's not just the core. And this is what we, we can see as an onion model of, of transition studies. It's, it's, Technology is at, at the core or has an important part of it, but then of course there are many more dimensions. For example, with every technology change, there comes a lot of infrastructural changes that complement the core technology. And to show you an even more complex picture um, and to introduce another central concept of our field, this is the concept of a social technical system. It's a system which combines many different elements as i said the technology part the infrastructure part but then we also have for example regulations and policies we have finances we have culture so especially for the car what does the car stand for what is it kind of meaning does it carry uh, we have the industry we have the suppliers of the industry we have the core manufacturers who produce these uh, artifacts we have maintenance we have markets we have user practices we have the fuel y you see there is a whole complexity of things at play and the, the the core idea is that always if you you know if you want these uh, social technical systems to change then you have to um, think about many of the elements you can start with one but then I mean the others need to change as well and this is one of the reasons which uh, make transitions a very difficult and complex process to provide you with a definition so social technical transitions are fundamental sense of disruptive competence dis destroying changes they are multi-dimensional this is what we saw in the slides before. Um, they're long-term and they're changes of these entire systems. And usually it helps me to think of a, of a system as, these, as one of these big sectors like transport or energy or agro-food. Um, it can be smaller, it's, 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 it's up to you how to define it, but um, usually we're talking about these very big systems in, in much of the transition studies literature. Then, of course, now we know a bit what a social technical transition is. We also have to address the concept of sustainability transitions. And I usually de define it, I mean, this, that sustainability transition is a particular kind of social technical transition. It's, it's those social technical transitions that are associated with sustainability targets, usually set by, by um, public actors. Um, saying, okay, in, let's say, 2030 or in 2050, we want to arrive at a net uh, zero carbon uh, society. And this applies to, for example, transport and energy and other fields. So that means there is change needed and this change is associated with sustainability targets. This might seem a little special, why, why, why do we not say these are just sustainable transitions? Um, the question is, as, as soon as you say just the, the problem is, and, and I will discuss it also later, the, the question is, uh, the, the issue is, as soon as you say sustainable, then the question comes up, what exactly is sustainable? And of course, our understanding of sustainable, I mean, first, we don't have a shared understanding of sustainability. This is what I showed before. Um, but then also our understanding of sustainability is likely to change all the time. So as we move on, and especially as we're talking about processes that go over decades, as we move on, also our understanding, also perhaps our priorities on which sustainability targets to address, all these things will change over time. Sustainability transitions can be viewed as a response, obviously, to the sustainability challenges discussed above. And there's also a particularity when we look at our field, there is this implicit normative assumptions, uh, assumption that sectors like these big ones I mentioned, that they have to change. So this, for example, makes our field 
different from uh, scholars in the field of socio-ecological systems. Those, I mean, there you have a strong focus on keeping systems intact. And here it's, I mean, we are, when we're talking about social technical, we are typically seeking for ways how to, to change them and to change them into a direction that is more sustainable. There are a lot of particularities of sustainability transitions. I will not go through them now in, in, in all detail. It's, I think it's just important to have them on one slide, to look at them later. Um, and, and, and these particularities, in a sense, they also reflect the, the, the complexity and dimensions we had we looked at before when we we were talking about climate change and why it's different from flying to the moon for me an important part of transitions and and this is also i mean we are here as part of the transitions community especially the nest uh, community um there is this for me there's this personal element in the in, in the in, in the in our community and i have experienced our field as a field where people come because they they are really interested in their topic they want to do something about it they want to let's say change change it for the better or make it make it make a relevant contribution and I, I i like it you can you can say well is what what should be the distance of the researcher to the to the to the object of study but for me this kind of uh, emotional contact with with the things you're studying and 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 you you want to or you try to improve things for the better that's one of the main for me one of the main assets of our community it's it's like i see a lot of people that want to make a difference rather than or in addition to pursuing a career and it's not the way it's it's not the other way around and that's that's important it's also I will show you a couple of, of, of numbers and, and, and things, but um, it's not so much about, I don't know, the number of papers or the number of citations or the number of likes you get. But in the end, all these, at least to me, all these things we do are a means to an end and not an end in itself. So just to show you a bit more about the community. Um, so there is uh, the, the, the core journal of transition studies. Um, there is the research agenda and also a selection, a special issue with selections, uh, with selected responses to this transition agenda to pro uh, provide guidance to the field. Then there are the uh, current statistics about how, how much is published in the field. It's a lot. Um, I, I cannot keep up reading. I, I try, but it's, it's, it's really a lot. Um, the newsletter, four times a year. Um, of course, the conference. There was a, a report also we have um, made first first uh, impact on policy making so that for example last year um, there was a report um, commissioned by the european environment agency um, that was solely focusing on sustainability transition and then of course we have the people behind it we have i mean fr from those times that i've also always <laughs> took all the pictures from last year um, where we could st still meet in person. Of course, there are these different kinds of events and uh, a nice network. So with that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm now turning uh, over to the, um, to the more, the, the next steps of, of, of research and where I think there are interesting things to be done. And um, I will particularly look into the topic of acceleration and it for me it usually helps to to think of transitions as developing in phases we can discuss this later on um, but for many years much of transition studies has focused on what i what we can call the first phase so this is about developing solutions for specific problem like cleaner technologies sustainable innovation in a, in a broader sense so here it's mostly about what are the barriers for new things to emerge it's a classic if you will innovation studies topic later and and for example now we see that 
the energy transition has moved into this phase, we see, wait, wait a moment, it's not just anymore about bringing technologies into the market and diffusing them more widely, but it's also about decline. We're especially discussing at the moment the decline of, of coal-fired power, plant, uh, uh, coal power plants. Um, there are changes in entire systems. It's not just one or two spots. This is what, oops, sorry. This is what I tried to picture here with this graph. So it's like in the first phase, you have singular innovations, but then it's like throwing a stone into a pond, then, then these waves go out. Um, whole systems are affected. And of course, it's about the acceleration and things are, so innovation and transition changes are moving more quickly. Then again, and in the past, but also lately, researchers have also pointed out that as these transitions accelerate and widen in scope, um, there will be more and more sectors or systems interacting. So we see it in energy. There is a lot of discussion about coupling, for example, energy transition and transport or bringing clean electricity also to uh, heating sector or to other industries. You know, there is so different sectors involved, but also there is the uh, there is the risk of that we create new lock-ins. For example, when we are now pursuing different pathways like electrification or potentially a hydrogen pathway, so we, we might create or we certainly will create the associated infrastructures. And that is also, there is also a risk, uh, a risk of course involved in that we create new, new lock-ins and we might even have dead-end pathways. So, for example, natural gas is, 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 is promoted by some as, okay, it's definitely better than coal, let's go for natural gas. But then again, I mean, if you're still building new pipelines today, it's like, okay, but these things have to pay off for, I don't know, the next couple of decades. So what does that mean for 2050 and zero carbon by then? So there are obviously contradictions and conflicts in the system. And just, to, to mention another thing that is coming up, um, we have been so far in transition studies, especially with this climate focus, um, primarily looked at, let's say, easy to decarbonize sectors. But then there are also these difficult to decarbonize industries. Uh, this is raw materials, so special materials, so like cement and steel, but this is also aviation, long distance heavyweight transport. Um, so there are also new challenges ahead and these are these are the things that i think will um will keep us busy uh, the next years this i will not go through every detail of this slide and i have uh, also sh shown this in, in in detail at the last ist conference for here just a few um words on what are the next transition challenges, especially when we um, look at uh, transitions that are accelerating. So I go and, and, and the, uh, I pick the electric car as, 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 as an example um, that can be used to illustrate many of these challenges. It, it's not the only one where this applies, but it can be used uh, quite nicely. And also some of these topics um, have been picked up as in, in these responses, they, are, they will be in the, re, uh, in the references, uh, in the responses to the STRN research agenda. So one topic is diversity. Andy Sterling has, has pointed to this all along, um, saying, okay, um, we have a certain pathway we are on, but there are competing technologies, competing configurations, and oftentimes it's, it's beneficial to have a certain variety uh, to pursue different options at the same time. And, and especially in transport, we see the following. It seems, or, or much of the attention is now directed to electric cars, electric vehicles. And while that is certainly, I mean, that always happens when you're in the middle of, an, of a hype, you cannot imagine that there are alternatives, but 
definitely 10, 15 years before, there was a similar hype around hydrogen vehicles and fuel cells. And I mean, as we are in these innovation hypes and fancy technologies, we also sometimes tend to forget that there are other alternatives to transport. They might seem boring, but they also do their job. So in that sense, it's, it's important to keep this variety. Um, this is a point I mentioned before, especially with acceleration, there's a risk of new lock-in. And um, we also have to think about, when we think about transition, different transition pathways, that they always come with different stakeholders. And we, for example, for example distinguished here, um, pathways where you say, okay, this is the current status quo, it's the existing regime, and the degree of sustainability is not high, but maybe you can, I mean, and so you certainly can pursue a pathway that increases uh, the degree of sustainability, but pretty much remains within the existing structure. And the electric vehicle is, a, is a, in, in my view, a classic example of this. Or you can say you follow a more disruptive pathway um, that is also more, also provides more sustainability, but where there is a higher um, disruption, especially for incumbent actors. And of course, whether one or the other pathway is chosen um, is, a, is a matter of, of influence and it's also a matter of contestation and the associated politics. Another problem that comes with transition and it's also something we have not, as a community, I think we have not really looked at closely is what Jeroen and co-authors um, called problem shifting. So that boils down to the question, how sustainable, how sustainable is the transition in the first place? And m many times, for example, um, we think, oh, this is a nice solution, but then everything we scale up to serve I don't know, hundreds, hundreds, thousands, millions, um, then it's it's clear that it will create new problems somewhere else. A typical example, again, from electric vehicles is the lithium or the cobalt or the um, e-waste you create with the car batteries. And of course, it's great to have electric cars because they solve emissions, the emissions problem in cities, they um, don't contribute or they, they, they don't have CO2 emissions, all these things. But then again, we, we are shifting, we are shifting some of our problems to other communities. And that's something we have to be aware of and also address in the suggestions we make. A related issue is like, okay, let's focus on one issue. In the case of the electric vehicle, it's, the oil, get rid of the oil, this is working, but the electric vehicle for sure is not a response to for the space we use in the city and for, for solving congestion. So we look at one sustainability issue, but not at an entire system. So there is another challenge here. And of course, last but not least, there are trade-offs between different sustainability goals. Okay, I will skip the next slides. You can have a closer look uh, at them um, if, if you like later. Um, I would just go to uh, the uh, opening up to, the, to, the, to a macro view on things. Um, like so far, we have mostly in transition studies looked at what we can call our pet systems, like energy, transport, water, food. Um, these have they, these are complex. These are big. They, these have strong technology components. But of course, there are other things out there that change, and there are major systemic changes out there. This is, has been taken up in, in, in the emerging literature on deep transitions. Um, but of course there, are, and just to give you a few examples, um, there are other, technolog uh, other technological innovations transition scholars are typically not looking very closely at. Artificial intelligence, the entire wave of digitalization, automation, these kinds of things. We also have many changes in political systems that are currently going on with a recent paper on this. And of course, we also see in, in, in on the economic dimension that there are changes. And it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge for us because we typically landscape these things. 
So they're just out there, they're context factors, of course, they're sometimes taken into account, but we do not really include them in, in our frameworks. Maybe it's also not our job to do that. But then again, I mean, like, for example, a, a few weeks back, when Giuseppe Feola presented his views at, at the NEST conference, um, it, it sometimes it's really important to look at bigger changes and, and having this macro perspective. And there is also a way of, I hope, of, of partly integrating these changes into our frameworks. All right, that was um, kind of a tour de raison um, on some of the acceleration challenges. And now in the last part, I will take a closer look at uh, climate change and the current corona crisis. This is work I've been doing in the last weeks and months uh, together with Danny Rosenblum from the University of Toronto. And essentially, I mean, the argument is, is, is if you will, pretty simple. We're essentially saying, okay, hey, time is running out. We need to act on climate change. We cannot, um, we cannot afford to wait and first solve one problem and then solve the other. Also, if we now spend billions on economic recovery for COVID-19, these resources will be missing um, if we don't use them immediately also for climate change. Well, this should be simple. At least you could think it's kind of straightforward. Unfortunately, we know from past experiences that the reflex, if there are a major crisis like Corona hits, policymakers tend to, to re-stabilize incumbent industries. We see that in almost every country that, I mean, incumbents come out, they demand uh, subsidies, they de demand these recovery funds, of course, always with the argument uh, just to, to, to save jobs and, and, and to keep the system going. That's understandable. And we, for example, we saw in the, in the 2008-9 financial crisis, um, there were, I, I don't know, there were, in Germany, there was a, with the car industry, there was a premium to buy new cars. In uh, Later in the millennium drought in Australia, the answer was, okay, let's go with incumbent technology. There is no water, why don't desalinate? And, and they also did other things, but the, the the point here is the standard reflection, uh, the standard reflex is typically go with what we have instead of exploring new things. Of course, this is understandable, and there is a, a paper I recently read, and I find it very interesting to describe how these lock-ins um, really work around uh, around the car and the car infrastructure. Um, you see that all these different dimensions are closely connected, and this is why it may, it's so difficult to deviate from the current pathway we're in. And um, and and this obviously resonates well with the our understanding of social technical regimes in in transition theory. And what we did on in in our papers on the um, on the corona crisis, we said, okay, we need to look at two key mechanisms that are core to at the core of transition studies. So one clearly is the disruption, a landscape level event that disrupts the existing, and the other is um, is about the alternatives. So it's about innovation. And we said, okay, one strategy is to harness this disruption to accelerate decline. If you if you think in in as a, of of a transition as a curve where where innovation diffuses and also on the other side where incumbent technologies decline, then this harnessing disruption strategy is an acceleration of decline. So we, our suggestion is to use the COVID-19 crisis and, and, and use this disruptive potential to, for example, get rid of fossil or reduce the amount of fossil fuels and what is then the, 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 the specific strategy to do? Um, definitely don't buy, bail out carbon intensive businesses um, because this only delays the transformation that is necessary anyway. And also perhaps better channel recovery to people and regions instead of firms. 
I know these things are contested, retraining, relocation, early retirement, build alternatives. It, it, it's time consuming, but just giving the money to the incumbents certainly will not do the job of also addressing climate change. And then the second part of the, the response is to um, look at innovation, the flip side, the, the, the core element of transition studies. Um, to say, okay, what are the alternatives? What are the alternatives we can address immediately? And what are the, those we can address in the longer run? And this also, especially with the changes in lifestyles and in daily practices we see right now in our lives, um, there is also an opportunity to, to um, continue or to, 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 to learn how to deal with these, I mean, to rethink our lifestyles, to um, explore what are the things we ha we are now forced to do, and maybe some of them are not as bad as they seem in the first place, um, and that could be also a strategy for each one of us to do our part to for for a more sustainable or low carbon uh, world. Of course, the question here is, what can we do, or what can policy do? to have some of these more sustainable. I mean, we, for, for example, in cities like Berlin or Paris or, or London, we, we currently see how roads are transformed for, for, for cycling. And now you have space for bikes. And of course, it's, it's also the season to bike. It, that certainly helps. But it's also, you know, then you get into exploring new things and doing things in a more sustainable way. That's definitely something I would like to seek to continue once the crisis should be over. Okay, with that, I guess we're at the end of the um, of what I wanted to share with you. Um, to wrap it up, I talked about the grand sustainability challenges, that they are special, that they need special frameworks to, uh, to, to be studied with, and sustainability transition research, in my view, can provide such a framework. It can provide orientation. It also can provide policy insights in how to guide these transitions. I'm not saying transition studies has the answers or is the only way to do that. And we also have a lot of things we still need to improve and do better. But uh, so far, it's, it's at least one of the approaches that in my perspective is promising in that regard. I also shared a few thoughts on acceleration challenges and new research uh, ideas that uh, we might want to address in the future. And of course, then what can we do, especially with a, with a view on the current uh, corona crisis? What can we potentially do to use it also to advance the climate agenda? All right. Thank you for listening. <laughs>